Genesis 9. I discovered that my glasses, you know, I haven't had them for the last two weeks, have y'all noticed, uh, that they went on a, a honeymoon too, you know, across the states in the south, and, uh, but I got them back. I have no idea what they saw on the trip. And, uh, but, uh, but now I can read the verse numbers again, and so maybe that will be a little bit better for each of y'all. So Genesis chapter 9. And so God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the air, on, on all that move on the earth and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man, and from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth, Thus I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Let's pray. Father, Lord, this is your word given unto us for your glory, your honor, your praise. And Lord, for the edification of those who are yours. And Lord, for the conviction of those who are not. And so let it have that purpose. And Holy Spirit, may you be the one ruling and reigning within us today to divide and discern. Be a discerner not only of the truth of your word, but also to be a discerner of our own thoughts and our intentions, God, that, that we might rightly be able to judge ourselves and to recognize these things within us, Lord, lest we give our ears to the cruel one and in our old age say, oh, I wish I would have. God, make us to be wise and listen to your word today. Lord, I pray that you would apply it to us today to know what we should take and how we should apply it and, and in what manner we should walk away and go forth from here. God, bless us as we look into it. Bless us to understand, to apply, to rightly divide. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> yes, sir. It is. Yep, it is. So I don't know if y'all knew or not, but y'all have another covenant with God besides the one that you may very well have through the person of Jesus Christ. This is the new covenant in my blood is what he said. And if you are washed in the blood of Christ, if you have received the atonement of his free gift, you are in a covenant with God. And that is the covenant for the atonement of your sins, and that is that your sin was put on the Lord Jesus Christ when he hung on the cross. And when he died, he died for your sins and none of his own. He'd had no sin to pay for on his own, so he was able to pay for yours. That's a covenant, but there's another covenant that you reside under, and that's the Noahic covenant. Because he told them to you and to all of your descendants, and as far as I know, we're all the descendants of Noah. In fact, that's exactly what the scripture says, is that through him, the world was repopulated. And it's a covenant that we have with him is one of the, the first things that is brought up here in this chapter. But the, the, the instructions that were given to them, God blessed Noah and his sons. He blessed Noah and his sons. And that was something they received right off the bat, that it was there before all things that they had received a blessing from God. And their commandment, which I think that the blessing was geared towards, is be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, blessing from God is something very difficult to understand. 
All the time we think that a, a blessing is going to be like a Christmas gift that's curtailed to, you know, to, to the thing that we want and how we want to be blessed. And we think, well, you know, money's great, and we expect that, well, a blessing of God would be financial. Well, health would be great, and a blessing of God would be perhaps physical, you know, and, and think along those lines. But really, when there's a blessing, you need to look and to see what is that blessing for. For example, have you been given a great voice and a spirit of worship? Well, then perhaps that blessing would be to serve him. You know, are you given a particular capacity or gift or something wherewith to serve him and to live out your life? And he gave them a blessing. And what was the blessing? Well, after the blessing, it said that he commanded to them to be fruitful and multiply. And so that very well could have been blessing the wombs of their wives and even their own capacity to procreate and to do those very things, to, to bless them with everything that they needed physically. Like Peter teaches that he's given us all things that pertain unto life. And not only life, but life and, and godliness also. But his instructions are be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The, the scripture says the fruit of the womb is his reward. The fruit of the womb is his reward. And, and in the United States, it's almost looked at if you have five or six or seven children, like you're some kind of an ignoramus. We had some friends. How many kids did the Becks have? Six? Was that six kids? Seven? Yeah, well, the number of completion. Why not? Why stop at six, right? They had seven kids, and, and literally there was an occasion when, you know, somebody asked his wife, she, they said, you know how that happens, right? Almost to ridicule her and to mock her and say, you know, and what, what is your problem? And I, I grew up in a setting, it was very common for one ethnic group to, to, to criticize another ethnic group for having so many children. Well, you know what? They didn't realize the particular ethnic group that crit was criticizing. Well, they had retirement, and they had bank accounts, and they had wealth. But for the ethnic group having so many children, the children were their retirement. That the plan was and the hope was that among their five or six or seven or ten children, by the time those children are in their 40s and you're broke down in your 70s and 80s, that those children each could send you $100 a month or something and, and to support them. But now we have Medicare and nursing homes or something like that. But being fruitful and multiplying and having multiple children is, it, it, children is not a bad thing. That is the commandment of God. He said the fruit of the womb is his reward. And I can't think of anything in my life that I have learned more about my relationship with God with than my own children. I could think about principles and concepts before I had children. But then after having children, I could feel those principles and concepts. And I said, oh God, this is different. This is helpful. I'm not saying it wasn't hurtful, but I'm saying it was helpful for me. And you wonder why it's good, but it's a good thing. But now we have such a narrative across this globe not to overpopulate the earth. And that is contrary to the desire of God. You realize that? That the movement across this globe and communist China and the World Health Organization and even here among certain you know, leaders and politicians that in the United States, hey, you need to have fewer children, less children, less children. We need to worry about overpopulating the earth. No, we don't. We need to fulfill the commandment of God and have children be fruitful and multiply and understanding what's of value. Now, Americans have been holding back on having children, not so much because they're afraid of overpopulation, but they're afraid of not having everything they want to have. Quite a number of people that Jennifer and I went to high school with and college with, you know, we got out right out of college and, you know, well, we had Reagan when we were finishing up college. And, you know, we got out and we saw some of our friends have nicer cars and nicer homes and nicer stuff and all that. And, boy, by the time we got up to 40, we had three little rascals and, and we had some of our friends say, we well, you know, I think we're going to try. We're like, you're crazy, you know. You're crazy that you're supposed to do that stuff when you're young, you know. But, but what we have, we've forsaken in so many cases, children, and carrying out this desire of God, what? Well, we need to wait till we're more financially settled. What do you tell the person in the third world country? Hey, you know, if you really want to be right and responsible, 
you need to wait till you have so much money. <laughs> They're like, that's not going to happen. We're going to have to have kids and rely on the provision of God. Yeah, that's what you're going to have to do. But this is this is not the first or the second or you know time that God has said that. It's something that He wanted man to do. Because, you know, I think about that in each of those possibilities, having children is an opportunity. God has used us as the vessels wherewith to create more of those things which are created in His image. We are part of that instrument that creates more people that are made up of body, soul, and spirit. But think about that in each, each one of those people. I have three children, and there's three opportunities for God for them to turn unto Him and to worship Him and to serve Him, and that's a blessing to God. I think God wants more possibilities. I think God wants more people to interact with. I think He wants more people to come unto Him. And we cannot do that by having less children. Rather, we should do that by having more children. And He said, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth. I would imagine that part of the great change that happened was that very thing, that perhaps before the flood there was not that natural innate fear. You know, there are a few animals in this world that are big enough that they're not very scared of you. You know, but for the most part, the animals of the world are afraid of you, even sometimes to your surprise. I've run across a couple bears in the wild, and you would think that your typical bear would just, you know, stand up and charge. And no, the typical bear, even a grizzly bear, is going to get up and say, no, I'm out of here. It's only in the places like Yosemite where they're, where they're just so over accustomed to people being there 24 hours a day that they get to the point where they're like, well, who are you? You got food? You know? But it's a, it's a natural common thing among uh, the world in general. And he says, and, and the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand, very much like back there in Genesis 1 and 2, that we should have dominion over them. He said, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. The dietary law was not given yet. And I believe the dietary law was something specific to Israel. And in fact, we had a little pastor's meeting this last week, and a, a gentleman came up to me and shared the church name. And by it all being in Hebrew, I was curious, and I got to talking to him and asking him questions, trying to figure out if he believed that we needed to keep the law or not. And, and we got to that point. And he didn't give me a straight answer. But one of the things he emphasized was, you know, the dietary laws. I told him I raised my own, you know, pork, my own meat hogs. And he said, yeah, and you're probably sick from it, too. You know, it's like, and I was like, no, I'm okay. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, but things like that, you know, in John, in the Gospel of John, it, it, it records and it, and it reminds us that Jesus declared all foods clean. He declared all foods clean. Paul supported that very thing as well in, in his theology, in his epistles that he gave unto us. But he said, uh, everything that lives shall be food for you. He said, I've given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat its flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning, and from the hand of every beast I will require it, even if... Now, that's, a, that's an amazing thing. If I go backpacking next month and a bear comes out of the woods and mauls me and kills me, God's like, hey, <laughs> Michael, hey, mark that bear. He killed a man. Why? Because a man is valuable to God. That's valuable to God. And, and that, why? Because that is an opportunity and that was a soul that was created with the potential and even the desire of God to interact with God. And God's like, that's not your soul, that's supposed to be mine. It's not your life to take, that's supposed to belong to me. And God places a very high value on the life of man here. You know, the, God places a value even on animals, which is really interesting. Y'all ever read the last line of the book of Jonah? <laughs> it's like, go read it sometime and you'll be like, what? You know, and... And he said, and shall I not have mercy? I don't know the exact quote. He said, but something along the lines, and then shall I not have mercy on this great number of people that doesn't know their right from their left, and also much cattle? And well, I guess God cares about the cattle too. I, you know, I, I'm not sure, but, but uh, he didn't take too kind when Balaam was beating his uh, donkey either, and he rebuked him through that donkey. But 
But he places a high value on man's life, and here he even uh, assigns the death penalty for man in regards to murder. He says, I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast, and I will require it from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man blood by man, his blood shall be shed. In other words, God said capital punishment should be employed from this point on. I know there's some dewy-eyed, mystical, theological thinking out there that we could just love everybody into godliness, and we could do away, and even that the idea of capital punishment is not loving. Rather, I'm telling you the truth, the idea of forbidding cash capital punishment is not loving. You don't have to look far. In fact, probably most of you can recall examples when a man went to prison for murder, and he spent 20 or 30 years in prison, maybe, maybe 15, maybe he just went to a halfway house for 10 years, and he got out and very promptly and quickly went and murdered others. Tell me, was it a loving thing to spare that man's life? Well, it sure wasn't loving for the latter victims, was it? When God gave his civil instructions to Israel when they left Egypt, he assigned capital, capital punishment for a number of things. He assigned the death penalty for quite a number of things. And what he said multiple times in there, he says, you shall stone him to death and put the evil away or out of your society or your culture or away out from the people. And the thing is, is if a murderer murders and he's put to death, he can never murder again. And he said, and he also said, he said, and others will look and will fear. When he gave the prescription of the death penalty, he said, listen, you will put the evil away from you permanently, and others will look and fear. Does that mean that that person should not have the opportunity for repentance? Remember what they said to Achan, who was Achan for trouble? If y'all recall, there was, when they got out of, they crossed over the Jordan, the very first city that they got to get to and to, to overcome was Jericho, and it was a massive walled fortress, and they had to march around it six times without saying anything on six different days. And on the, on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times, and when the trumpets blew, they gave out a great shout, and the walls came down, and they went and plundered Jericho. And God said, but listen, everything in there is unto the Lord. You shall not take a single thing. And a man named Achan took a mantle. And something else, I can't remember, and he hid it in his tent. And, uh, but he, he had it there in his tent, and then following that, they, they experienced absolute defeat. And God told Joshua, listen, there's sin in the camp, and it was found out that it was Achan. And when they came down to Achan, do you know what they said? Achan, you're cursed to hell forever, and you can't know. What did they say? Achan, give God the glory <laughs> and tell us what you've done. You know, you mean even a person in that situation can give glory to God? Yes. By standing up there and saying, listen, I was wrong and God is right. And I know it means the death penalty for me. But tell me, which would be the better, better, better way to die in repentance and confession or in belligerent rebellion and denial? You know, uh, we, we look at the end of life as, as so ultimate, but it's not. It's the end of this life on this earth. But he said that, and, and you know, that was even carried into the New Testament. You wonder, well, where can you find evidence for the, you know, the death penalty in the New Testament? I'll just give you one simple one. There's others, but Paul believed in the death penalty. In fact, he even told Festus, he said, listen, Festus, you know, examine me. If I've, if I've committed anything worth death, so first of all, he acknowledged that there was offenses that were worth death worthy of death. And he said, Festus, if I've committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. He said, that would be right. I'll die if I've committed any offense worthy of death. Obviously, Paul believed, <laughs> well, if there's any time that you want to be sure that you believe in the death penalty, when it's your own prescription, that is a rock-solid conviction. You can rest assured. But there was that principle. And maybe it seems very hard to the one who has committed the offense, but listen, it's even harder for the innocent ones who are the ones to be offended in the future. 
repeat crimes are a heinous thing, and I believe judges and juries share in those crimes. When they let a man go, and they let a man, and they assumed him to be okay in this way or the other, and he got out and he murdered or he raped, you know, one, two, three, four, ten more people. That's the mind of God. That was the mind of God here in Genesis 9. It's the mind of God in Exodus through Deuteronomy. You know, that that is the way he presented things to be. He says, uh, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he has made man, and that's the significance of the value of man. That's, the, that's why a man is valuable. And when, when God said that you shall not, when, well, when the Lord said that you shall not say unto your brother, Raka, you know, th that's what we want to say on I-20 when some foolish man is driving in a foolish way. And, you know, if, if you're like me, you come up with one of these statements, you know, like, I, I, you know when you're passing me, like, I, I need to see what an idiot looks like. What, you know, what? And, and I think about it, I say, wait, wait a second. There's value in that person. They may be a fool. That is true. But any living soul is a valuable thing because it has potential to worship him. It has that potential to turn unto him. And I'm sure there's been a myriad of losers by man's estimation that have turned unto the Lord and been something very wonderful in the kingdom something quite outstanding in the kingdom. But that is the value of people. And when you have trouble, you know, honoring or respecting people, you have to remember that they're created in the image of God, and that is the value that's placed on, on them. And again in verse 7, And as for you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I will establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is, is with you, the birds and the cattle and every beast of the earth with you. All of that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between the earth, between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the water shall never again become a, become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all the flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now, I think it's a very incredible thing that God created a judgment that was empirically evident for all generations to come. He has written it literally into earth history, right? You know, anytime you see strata and fossil deposits, and, you know, at 8,000 feet elevation, and, you know, and they're trying to figure this out, well, there's, there's obviously evidence that the earth has flooded. And I think it's rather interesting that he sealed up that judgment and authenticated it with the assurance that it will never happen again. There's been people that were worried about global floods associated with global warming. You know, that if it gets warm enough, you know, and the ice caps melt and Antarctica melts and everything melts, you know, how high is the water going to rise and is everything going to be flooded and how much of the earth will be decimated? And, and, and God said, listen, just, just so you know, you know, obviously, empirically, that the world is flooded. And just so you know, I did it. I'll make sure it never happens again. Can you all understand how that would work? Maybe, you know. 
We had a really strong guy in this congregation. And we came in one day, and there was a 500-pound rock sitting up here. And we say, well, you know, who, who put that rock there? And well, the strong guy said, well, I put the rock there. Half the people said, I don't believe you. Well, the next week he came up here, you know, anonymously and removed the rock. You know, and they said, well, who removed the rock? He said, well, I removed the rock because I put it there. And he said, and just so that you'll believe me, I will assure you that that rock will never be there again. Why? Because nobody else can do it. You know, it's like nobody else can do it. You understand that, that by his covenant and promising that the earth is never going to flood again, it's a yearly reminder to every doubting scientist and every skeptic and every person who would very much like for their theory for the earth to be flooded again in some way. It's never going to happen. And it's an additional authentication of God to say, listen, it's obvious that it happened, but listen, since I did it and I have the power, I promise you that it'll never happen again. How? Well, I put my covenant in. It is an interesting that the, the time in which the rain began, he also used the refraction of that light through that rain to create the covenant sign that would be that sign of the covenant for us as well. But that's not really what I want to dwell on this morning. But he says, I've established it between me and all the flesh that is on the earth. And now verse 18, now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the whole earth was populated. And Noah, and so, I mean, there again, there's, in the previous chapters, it said that those eight were the only flesh that survived. And again, here it says that from the whole earth, that they, you know, that from them, the whole earth was populated, and I say that because if you really, if you look into it, you'll find all kinds of ideas and liberal, liberal theology that assumed that yes, there must have been other people that made it, and you know it probably wasn't a co total flood, and 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 you understand why, you know, conservative Christianity has to take the Bible literally. Why we have to believe it? Because if you, if you hack away at the authenticity of one place, you'll go and you'll hack away at the authenticity of another one, according to your heart's desire. It's a very dangerous thing to do. But he said that from them the whole earth was populated, but I want to talk to you about the dreadful legacy of sin. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. The extent of our depravity will never really be realized until we have a, a zealous goal of godliness. You, you can never know how far off the mark you are until you make the mark your goal. And this is very easily illustrated. We've probably all watched American Idol, right? It wasn't that the original, maybe American Idol? I don't I really, I always, maybe I'm really savage individual. I love to watch the auditions. And you have people come in there with absolute sincerity. They're, they're not trying to be clowns. They're not trying to be goofy. They're, they're sincere and as serious as they can be. And they come in there and they say no. And then, you know, the judges, that's why, well, you know, can you sing? Oh, yeah, I can sing. You know, my friends tell me I can sing. My family tells me I can sing. I, I can sing, you know. And then Unchained Medley starts. Oh, my love, my darling, you know, and ooh, you're like, okay, okay, that's enough, really, no, and let me sing another song. No, that's okay, that's okay, really, you don't have to sing another song. How could they be so blind and tone deaf and undiscerning? But the truth is, is they never came to the knowledge of their insufficiency, if you will, until they pursued 
professionalism, if you, yeah, if you could look at it that way. Until they went and got into the true presence of real talent and people with ears that could perceive and hear and, you know, tone and quality. And, and they, they never knew until that day. Wow, I can't sing. And, and a lot of them walked out of that, you know, room just in absolute denial. No, they don't know. Well, I, don't, I don't know. They produce a lot of songs and, you know, they're in the business and they make millions doing it. You know, you might... Might listen to them. But they never know until that day, until they go to be tested and examined and scrutinized and held to a standard. And when that happens, that's when they realize how short they fall of the glory of a professional singer, right? You know, they, they fall very far and very short. But what I'm saying is that we will never realize because there's, a, there's something that's continuing in us, and that is a huge capacity for some of the most ungodly things that you haven't even imagined yet. And very often in our young Christian lives, we assume that sanctification is 90% complete and that I am quite a bit Christ-like, and much more so than most other people. I mean, obviously. And, you know, and, and the idea of gross sin and egregious sin coming into our lives becomes, you know, kind of silly and unrealistic in our mind. But I want to warn us that there is a capacity within each of us to sin in a way that you have never imagined yet. It, it, it intensifies as you grow in the Lord. And I, I, I'd like to give you some examples. We just don't have to, like, imagine. I, I'll tell you this, that it was, it was Billy Graham in 1983 at the conference at Amsterdam. And it wasn't a crusade. It was a conference to four or 5,000 know, ministers, church workers, evangelists, you know, along those lines, these were people in career ministry. Several thousand people. And Billy Graham got up there to speak. And he said something, not a perfect quote, but along these lines, at the age of 64 in 1983, after having been in full-time ministry for 40 years and led over a million people to Christ, been on multiple continents, multiple countries, and lived through quite a bit. You know what he told those people? He said, the worst thing I can say to you is that sometimes before going and trying to speak on the enormous theme of the holiness of God, I myself still have some of the most ungodly thoughts in my heart. And, and he said it like some, he said right before, he said sometimes right before I go and to speak on the enormity of the holiness of God, I still have some of the most ungodly thoughts raging in my heart. That's what he said. I still have some of the most ungodly thoughts raging in my heart. Now listen, I want to ask, do you think you're on another level than Billy Graham? And you're like, well, what, what, why the struggle, bro? I don't get it. I don't, I don't really have that. Are you eyeballs deep in the warfare like he was? I mean, have you really planted your feet and dug in and said, listen, Romans chapter 8 says that I was predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ, and I was created in his image, and I was created for him and his workmanship, and by golly, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to live out this life if it costs me my comfort or my health or my you know, peace or whatever it is. I'm going to do that and live that out. Do you realize how much you, you get up on the front lines and the nitty-gritty? That's the worst thing that Satan wants to hear from you, then you find yourself so deep and entrenched in the battle that the war that is waging even around you and within you is more intense than you'd ever known in your life. It intensifies. I, I've been studying this and reading this for the past several years. I wish I had already taken the time to sit down with gentlemen older than me and farther along than me in the Lord, and to say, listen, what has your experience been? 
And what have you seen? Because I see this already in my own life, and I'm young and not even all that zealous, if you will. <laughs> you, know, I don't, you know, but I see this. I see this occurring, and it and it's not just us. There's our capacity to sin. There's a, there's a telling and is testing. You know, in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then in chapter, I mean, in verse 10 of chapter 17 of Jeremiah, he said, I, the Lord, try the reins and search the heart. That he is the one that's examining and searching the heart and to, to render ever, unto each man according to his deeds. And there's, there's a testing that he does. He tested Moses. He tested Abraham. He tested Jacob, right? He tested over and over and over. He tested people. What does James teach us in chapter 1? Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But he said, but let patience have its perfect work. That's your commandment. But let patience have its perfect work. In other words, you have to ratify that testing. You have to embrace that testing. Like when he tested Abraham and said, Abraham, take your son, take your only son, and, and offer him as a burnt offering unto the Lord. That Abraham did not run, and he didn't shrink back, and he didn't go hide, and he didn't spend ten years doing donuts in some desert trying to avoid this testing and this evaluation. And it's very hard, and it's very intense. I have no idea what the spiritual battle was like for Abraham in three days' journey, going to Mount Moriah, leaving the servants behind, walking up that mountain with his son. Horrible agony. Horrible agony. Every fiber of faith, of trust, of assurance, everything that he possibly knew, he probably thought back you know, when, when his first calling, he probably thought back to when he came into Shechem. He probably thought about when he came into Egypt and lied about Sarah. He probably had to think over and over and over. He probably thought about when he came and he made that covenant. The Lord made that covenant with him and he had to chase off those birds from those severed carcasses that, that the Lord passed in between with that glowing furnace. He probably had to summon up every bit of of experience and knowledge that he had with the Lord to, to follow through with that testing. And it was probably in those times, in those dark moments, that some of the most ungodly thoughts and feelings, calling God to question. I don't think he was above that. I mean, I know the scripture doesn't tell us. I would love to assume that he went without any trouble, but everything I know about man and everything I know about the, test, the testimony of any man who's really been tested by the Lord, that's not the way it goes. He said in Deuteronomy, I want you to love me with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your might, with everything you got, and that doesn't mean a cakewalk. The Lord wants your superior, supreme devotion above all things, but the telling is in its testing, and we see what did he do with Moses. And Moses, in, in Exodus, he went, and he, and he told him, hey, Moses, go and strike this rock. You know, and, and Moses went and struck the walk, rock, and the water came out for, for the people. And then I believe it was either in Leviticus or Numbers, I think it was in Numbers, the same situation came about. The people were thirsty. They grumbled. They grumbled against God. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Moses had had it up to here. And he went up there, and what did he do? And God said, speak to the rock this time. But Moses went up there, and what did he do? His, his anger was evident. He said, do we have to go and fetch water for you numbskulls too? Whack! Anger. Ungodliness outburst of wrath, contrary, and it was contrary to God's desire, because you know what God told him after that? He said, how come you did not choose to sanctify me and show me holy before the people this day? And for this cause, you should not enter into the land. Mm. You see that there's a lasting consequence for sin in our lives. 
I don't mean to say that we lose our relationship with God. I don't mean to say that we lose our salvation. But what I'm saying is that within us is a capacity to sin, and there's no such thing as sin that does not have ramifications an ongoing influence and an impact. There was Elijah, Elijah that went up onto Mount Carmel with 400 prophets of Baal in a time of drought, and he challenged them, right? Hey, let's put up offerings, and you call upon Baal, and I will call upon the Lord. And, and you know, they did everything they could and cut themselves and hopped around like monkeys and jumped up and down, stood on their heads. I don't didn't say everything, but evidently they tried a lot, and nothing happened. And he said, okay. He said, I want you to take water, precious water, dump it all over the sacrifice. Hey, do it again. And they tell it, fill the trench around. And then he called upon the Lord and the Lord consumed it. And it was a massive victory. And he said, listen, he said, seize those 400 prophets and kill them and put them to death. And that happened. And then you know what? One angry woman sent him a nasty gram. And she said, Jezebel, she said, God, do the God, may the gods do more so to me if you're not like one of these tomorrow. In other words, like one of these prophets of Baal did. And I would imagine in the fatigue and being tired of it all and just ready to be done with the spiritual battle, he said, I've had it. And he took off and he fled and he left his servant behind and he went into the wilderness a day's journey and he requested that he himself could die. And y'all know the rest of the story that, that the Lord strengthened him with food and water and he went 40 days in the strength of that food and water to the Mount Horeb and he was there in the cave and God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? In other words, I didn't really call you to be here. You know? And he said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, you know, and then he gave him his pity party. You know, this, this, and this, and I alone, and there's nobody else. And he said, well, go outside and y'all know the story of wind, earth, and fire. And I'll never forget now that wind, earth, and, and, and fire... It was, was, a, uh, was more like an R&B groove band, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I got corrected one night. You know, it's like, were those the hippies? And they're like, no, those were not the hippies, you know? And I was like, okay, I got it. But y'all know, they, they know that there was that, what, that great wind and that great earthquake and that great fire, but God wasn't in any of them. And afterwards, a still small voice came to him. And guess what it asked him? The same old question. Elijah, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. Elijah, you're not really where I want you to be. In, in other words, if you do the math, that's sin. You know, it means like, Elijah, I didn't call you to do this. I didn't call you to shrink back into a hole. I didn't call you to, to, to get in some kind of pity party and depression. And by the way, Elijah, I still have 7,000 reserved unto me that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And, you know, and, but, but how did that happen? Elijah should have been this rock-solid Billy Graham battle axe, right? He's done this, he's done that. Listen, you still have a capacity within you. And it's something that we should be concerned about, we should be worried about. You remember David. David was no rookie. David, at a young age, knew what it was like to put his life on the line in faith for the Lord and to say, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? And he went out there with a sling and a stone, or several stones. And he defeated Goliath, and he was anointed king. And then he was so faithfully patient to wait for that appointment by God, and he had opportunities to kill Saul, and he didn't. And he had times when his men wanted to commit mutiny and and, and to kill him, and, and he lived through those things. There was a time in, from, at Ziglag when he thought that all of his family and all of his belongings were absolutely taken from him, and he had no idea. And he had been through the spiritual ringer, right? 20 years, 30 years, who knows how long. Nevertheless, that same man found himself in a place where he shouldn't have been looking at something he shouldn't have seen and then doing something he shouldn't have done. You realize we still have a freaky capacity for ungodliness. Just a really astonishing capacity for ungodliness. The telling is in his testing. And sometimes we prematurely suppose that we're godly. The truth is, is that you just really haven't been tested. 
you really have not been evaluated. You know, that every once in a while there's some cocky, testosterone-driven amateur fighter that thinks he's really something, and he gets online and runs his mouth and challenges some pro fighter. It happens a lot. You can find the fights on YouTube, you know, and they really think, but they, the trouble is they've never really been tested. And they'll go and they'll set up the appointment, and it's an absolute horrible beatdown that all the expectation and self-confidence that they had, that they would be able to, to stand in that testing. I mean, it was a joke, you know, and they just get totally annihilated and clowned, you know, and, and thrown around and beat down. But that knowledge never came until the testing. They were absolutely convinced, in the proverbial sense, that they were righteous. Listen, God has tests and evaluations for us that we haven't even gotten to. He's given us the extreme examples like Job and Abraham in scriptures to know, hey, listen, do you think you graduated? I got another one around the corner for you. You better put on your most holy faith and draw near unto me because there's more growing to do. There's another way that we find out our capacity to sin and who we really are. And one is in the telling of his testing, another one is in the purity of his presence. I've always noticed over the years with remodeling work that women can perceive color better than men. That's just a fact. There's sometimes that I've had navy blue slacks and black slacks, and I have to go to Jennifer and I'll say, hey, which ones are these? You know, <laughs> are these the navy blue or are these the black? I can't tell, but, you know, all the rest of the women in the world out there, well, you know, men won't care, and the women will say, like, he's got navy blue slacks on and a black shirt. You know, like, that doesn't work. You know? But I have to ask her, you know, hey, well, what's, you know, which one is which? But they can perceive color better than we can, and they can see things better than we can. I, I've learned that people think that a color is a particular color until you get the real color next to it. They would come in here and they would say, oh, yeah, when, you know, my wall's painted white, you know, like that lower, you know, and I was, well, that's not white. But imagine if you had a whole room painted just that tan color. And they're like, this is white. I'm like, no, that's not white. And they, yeah, it is. And I walk out to my truck and I grab an invoice that's on white paper. And I walk back in and I hold it up to the, to the off-colored tan wall. And I say, look, this is white. Oh, I thought it was white until I saw white next to it. And yeah, that's the problem is, is when we do not have a righteous example to set next to ourselves, we very often think that we've attained and that we're a lot further along and a lot wider than we are. And when we get close to the pure white of Jesus Christ, we realize we're still kind of dingy. And we're not just as wide as we thought. And so there's one way that we realize our capacity to sin, and that's the telling of his testing. And when the pressure is put on, and when the calling is given, and when God is asking you to do things that you've never done before in a way that you, you, know, that you just don't know how and where, and you find out your weakness is there, but also... It was in Isaiah chapter 6. And I have a feeling reading all of Isaiah and getting a, a feel for Isaiah that Isaiah was very much like Daniel or Azariah or Mishael or one of those young men from Judah. But Isaiah had a good testimony from the beginning. But what happened? He got call, caught up in a vision of the throne room and the seraphims, right, worshiping God and God on his throne and his train that filled the throne room. And what was his response? Woe is me, I am undone. I am undone. I am, I am, woe, I'm, you know. And he got next to purity. He realized how impure he was. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. He wasn't the only one. I would imagine that 2,000 years ago, a, a burly, jovial, blue-collared fisherman got up one morning and went fishing like every other day and probably cracked some coarse jokes and, and did some manly stuff and, and probably just thought very well and fine of himself until another man came along, Jesus of Nazareth. And he sat there and he listened to Jesus preach. 
And when Jesus came along to him, he told Jesus, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. But I am convinced that that confession did not come along until the presence of Christ did in his life. Because that is the thing, do you realize, that one of the convictions of the Holy Spirit in John 16 is the righteousness of Christ. You're like, well, why? He says, because I go to the Father and you don't see me anymore. But why do we need to realize the righteousness of Christ? Because when you realize the righteousness of Christ, you realize that that's not what you are. You realize that's not what you are. You just went up against a pro fighter and realized that you're very amateur. Be like trying to climb a rock wall with a professional climber and you're a nobody that just started. They're trying to do anything like that, the telling is that the purity of his presence will give it away. Peter did that very thing. Paul thought himself to be a very zealous man, a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? Circumcised on the exact day and all this stuff that he went over in Philippians chapter 3, right? Of the tribe of Benjamin, who of all, you know, and I mean super duper, considered himself to be very zealous. But one day on the road, what did he, on the road to Damascus, thank you. You know, he, uh, who appeared unto him? The Lord. And when the Lord appeared unto him, he instantly knew that he was not righteous. He was just undone and turned upside down. And who are you, Lord? Righteousness had never come near to him, and so he mistook himself as being righteous. There was Paul and even John, John the Apostle, in his you know, last decade of his life, nearing 100 years old. John, who had gotten to walk with the Lord and lay on his breast at the table and and been so close to the Lord, the man who described himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, the man who wrote first and second and third John, the man who was responsible for planting and pastoring churches, the man who went to martyrdom by tradition, by, by church history, and they attempted to boil him in a vat. So, I mean, there's no doubt about sincerity there, right? Very sincere man, like, I'm going to go to martyrdom. I'm not going to renounce the Lord Jesus Christ. Eventually was exiled to Patmos. But listen, when the resurrected Lord appeared unto him and that purity was in his presence, he said, I fell down like a dead man. He realized how up there he was and how down here he was. Our capacity to sin. Are you mindful of it? Some of these people weren't beginners, you know. Noah, this is the only stain on Noah's resume that we have. I mean, he only had 120 years of ministry under his belt, at least in the ark. That's a little bit of time to get to know Jesus. <laughs> it's like That's longer than most of our lives, all of our lives, isn't it? You know, 120 years. Exceptional man. You know, uh, in the Hall of Faith over there in Hebrews. Noah, how did you manage to get drunk? I'm sure excuses could be made. But just to be clear, drunkenness is sin. It's not, Proverbs teaches us, wine is a mark, mocker and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Paul teaches us, do not be drunk with wine wherein is dissipation, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. And over and over, what the Scripture teaches us, that drunkenness is a sin and it's not right. Maybe you could say, well, you know, it was in the vintage season and he didn't know just how strong it would be. And, well, I promise you he didn't take a shot and wait 20 minutes. Obviously. Usually, I don't know if you've been drunk. I have plenty of times, you know, to realize that's not the thing to do uh, quite some time ago. You know, if, if, <laughs> but uh, uh, pre-Jesus, by the way. But, uh, but normally you have to be like, hey, yeah, I can kind of feel this and I'm drinking another one. Yeah, I can really feel it. I'm drinking another one. I can, it's a conscious decision, you know. Unless he had some kind of crazy, but it was just said, you know, that it was a vineyard. And that he drank of the wine thereof and was drunk. And he became uncovered in his tent. And that was the first mistake. 
And I would imagine that a great number of people, and even people might read this today and say, well, that was his business. If he wants to get drunk, well, that's fine. And okay, well, maybe you're right that God has given him the liberty to, to get drunk. But I want to know what was the chain of events and what was the causality of his drunkenness. What did it lead to and, and what did it contribute to in Ham? The father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both of their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now there's a big question here, what actually happened? Well, there's some midrash you know, from rabbis that say that, that Ham castrated his father, but there's no grounds for that, and there's... It's just speculative and, and, uh, and basically like a lot of Hebrew midrash, but that's commentary by rabbis, by the way, uh, that it's just rooted in some kind of tradition from a rabbi along the way. Some point, I don't know that there's much, you know, others say, well, it was just that literally what it says that he saw his dad naked. I don't know how it is experientially for y'all. But I've played sports. I've gotten dressed in locker rooms. I've been out in the middle of nowhere taking baths and streams with other men. And I, we were naked. It was not a spiritual problem. It was not, at least it wasn't for me. I don't know what's in their hearts. I don't want to know. You know what I mean? But it was not a spiritual problem. There was no conviction there. Anybody who understands you, you suppose David with his 400 men running around the wilderness all managed to keep themselves covered. You know, it's like, no, it's not, it's not realistic. But how does the Bible use this phrase? I don't believe it was just a matter of him seeing his father naked. But I'll give you an example. You can find lots of them. But look in, in Leviticus, Exodus, Leviticus. If you'd like to, Leviticus twenty twenty seven. And I'm just looking within Scripture to answer a question in Scripture, and and uh, not necessarily demanding this, but but if we're going to look anywhere, let's look within Scripture. Look at Exodus twenty verse seventeen. I think I just said twenty seven. Now, y'all know to pray for Jennifer. Okay. Exodus twenty seventeen. I wrote down the wrong scripture, but that's okay. Uh, 18, 6. How about that? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong book altogether. Leviticus. <laughs> It's a small book there between numbers and I was like, that's not yeah. 2017. Here we go. I'm getting there. We'll start Bible drill next week. 2017. He says, if a man takes his sister and his uh, his father's daughter or his mother's daughter and sees her nakedness and she sees his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness, and he shall bear his guilt. If a man lies with a woman during her sickness and covers her nakedness, he has exposed her flow, and she has been uncovered from, you know, uh, has uncovered the flow of her blood. Both of them shall be cut off from their people. He just jump back a couple verses in 18, 18, 6, a couple chapters. In 18.6, it uses the same language. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. What it is, is that it's a nice, polite Hebrew euphemism to engage sexually. At least that is how the rest of the Pentateuch uses it. So I would think that if you want to understand what it means in Genesis chapter 9 is to take it for what it means throughout the law. And that would mean to have intercourse with. And it's, I think, somewhat supported that idea, you know, that it says that when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. 
Now, some people assume that he went and asked Shem and Japheth, but I don't know. It just says that he knew what was done to him. But that was the thing that that happened, and, and specifics are not given, but I think that there's enough there that we can understand through the rest of Scripture intertextually what happened there. Nevertheless, it was a great offense. And it says, So Anoah woke, verse 24, from his wine, knew what his younger son had done to him, and he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Now, first of all, Shem is the line of Abraham and therefore the line of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why preeminence is given to him above all things in the narrative of Scripture that we have to understand that a much bigger and more important picture is being painted here than the details of these individual lives. But I want to talk to you about that we saw Noah's capacity for sin even after so many years of service. We saw it in all of those biblical figures. We can probably even think back into some individuals that we know of or have known personally that also were demonstrated a great capacity to sin. But I want to talk about the causality of that sin and therein the title, The Dreadful Legacy of Sin. I read a little bit online and in commentaries and whatnot about this passage of Scripture this week. And everybody seemed to be preoccupied with the apparent, their perceived apparent unjust action of God. Why did God curse Canaan for Ham's sin? Well, to be sure, we note that the Scripture teaches us that the Son does not answer for the sins of the Father, and the Father does not answer for the sins of the Son. But then also the Scripture says that He visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons and their sons. What's going on? What is happening here? And really, what is the causality of all? Really, I don't think that this is the appointed curse of God, but rather the declared curse curse and whose fault is it whose fault is it does that mean that that god saw the actions of ham this day when he did this very act whatever it may have been and said well ham because you did that i'm going to make all of your descendants extra ungodly now god's the author of ungodliness do you think that's it i don't think that's it Ham, since you were ungodly, I'm going to make sure all your grandsons and great-grandsons are... That's not God's desire. He wants them to be saved. He wants to turn unto him. Y'all remember in Timothy that he would desire all men to be saved, that he wanted them to be saved, that he gave even what the, the, the inhabitants of Canaan 400 years to repent before he brought judgment unto them. That he waited and he waited, but really I think this is the announcement of God, the prophecy of God, the proclamation of God. Listen, listen, in other words, hey, guys, Noah, with your actions and with the actions of Ham, do you realize what kind of a sin legacy you're going to create in the descendants of Canaan? Noah, if you behave like that, and if Ham, if that's the person that you are, do you know you're going to make three times the son of hell your own son, Canaan? And Canaan, if that's the kind of person you are, do you know what kind of ungodly legacy you're going to have? I'll tell you what you're going to have because of who you are and what you are and the legacy you leave behind and the personalities and the, the values that you, you know, you encourage in your children and your descendants, you're going to end up being the servant of servants. You're going to end up being the lowly. You're going to end up being in this position. Don't think that our actions don't have an impact on our ancestry, on not our ancestry, but on our, our descendants, or that our ancestry. You all know this is evident so easy. You realize that young ladies who have a mother that's a prostitute have an incredibly higher rate of being a prostitute themselves. Y'all know that children with 
children with one parent that's been divorced and remarried has a 50% more chance of divorcing themselves? Do you know that children who have both parents who have divorced and remarried have a 200% greater chance of divorcing themselves? Do you all know that young men who have fathers who are absent, involved in crime, have incredibly higher rates of being in crime themselves? God warns us that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, so be very careful what kind of tree you are. Yes, he does visit your iniquity. He sees it in the following generations. Remember, how, where in the world did Isaac learn to lie to a ruler about his wife? I don't know. You know, the most terrifying thing, one of the most terrifying things I ever learned through speaking Spanish is that the root word for paternal is pater, and that it's not only that, but it's also used as the root word for pattern. Paternal pattern, do you know those words are related? Through the Koine Greek word pater. And when I heard that, I became frightened because I know who I really am, and I'm the pattern for three little ones back there. Well, one's not so little anymore. They're not, they're not little anymore. Right? What makes people think that the ungodliness that was sent down the line of Ham was the doing of God? Rather, I think God warned them about it here and said, watch out, Ham. You're a rascal, and you're going to have little rascals, and those little rascals are going to have little rascals. But praise be to God, you know you can escape that generational sin. Through the person of Jesus Christ, you can turn to him, and you can overcome it. You can come out of it. You know those people are, are born into slavery in that sense. I know we're all born as slaves to sin, but I tell you what, it's nowhere more evident than in ungodly cultures especially in poverty culture, you know, where you have three or four generations of alcoholics or drug users. And you realize and you see a child born into a, a, a drug-using, drug, you know, addict household, and you see Roy right now, boy, they have slave, drug slave written on them, and they need to be redeemed, and they need to be pulled out of there. How? Through the person of Christ. That's the only way to overcome those influences. What I'm saying today to us is make sure you're not that kind of influence. Make sure you're not that kind of influence. Realize that if Noah had the capacity for ungodliness, so do you. And it wasn't inert ungodliness, was it? I don't think that Noah can say, I had nothing to do with the ungodliness of Ham. Oh, yes, you did. Yes, you did, and you better sign up for the responsibility. I'm not saying he didn't take responsibility, but I'm saying that he couldn't refuse it. He had to understand that he played a part in that, and that is what we call generational sin. You see something in, you know, a lot in theology called generational curses, but they have the wrong idea about it. They're thinking that God is perpetuating ungodliness and a curse through that line. Then really it's the behavior and the, and the, and the likeness of the people themselves that do it. And we see it in cultures. It's not hard if you study cultures that you, you see that different cultures have different tendencies of sin. And we see it even here in this culture as it was sent down the, the line that our capacity to sin, the causality of sin, and the dreadful legacy that can be left, the capacity we have to do that very thing. And it says in verse 28, And Noah lived after the flood 350 years, so all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. One of the oldest in the Old Testament, and quite a life to live. But let us be wise. Realize that it's not over until it's appointed unto you to die. And the wonderful news from Scripture is says that when he appears, that we'll be made to be like him. That's the, that's the, the done point. Like what did Paul say? Paul commuted his communicated his ungodliness to us, and, you know, and that which I would not do, that I find myself doing, and that which I would not, that I do, and it's no longer I, but sin in me. And he talked about the war of his members and 
and back and forth. And, and later, what did he say? He said, not that I have attained. He said, but the one thing that I do is I press forward towards that goal. And that goal for him was Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. And I would love to tell you that in my experience that the, that the battle has calmed down and chilled out as I have gotten older and grown in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I tell you what, the battle in my own life is more fierce right now than it ever has been in my entire life. More severe. And, you know, you think that it would be like, oh, you know, doesn't this taper off? I, not that I know it, maybe. Maybe he might give seasons of, of peace and rest. But I'm more afraid of myself today than I've ever been. And I think that's a good place to be. Let's pray. Father, teach us to be wise. Like our brother David said, to number our days and to know the end of them in order that we might be wise with how we live them. Lord, may you forbid that any of us, through doubt and foolish action, God should leave a tainted legacy of lukewarmness or kind of sort of, you know. But Lord, let our children see sincerity and truth, and our grandchildren see the same in them, Lord, and bless us to leave a legacy for faith in you, God, rather than ungodly things. Lord, keep us from foolishness. And Lord, protect our children from the foolishness of the world. Lord, from the prosperity that they're born into. God, I'm, I'm more concerned about the prosperity our children have than anything else. God, keep it from ruining them. Lord, make them to be wise and to understand how fragile they are in this world and their need for you. Lord, bless us to be your servants your harvesters, your gatherers, Lord. Lord, your soul winners, your witnesses. That's your idea, and that's your commandment, Lord. And may we, God, fall into place in that. Lord, we pray to receive power from your Holy Spirit, God, in order to be those witnesses. God, and that you would do in us according to your will and your desire, and the very thing for which you called us and sanctified, like our brother Paul said, that we might lay hold of that for which we were laid hold of. God, that we want to do. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.